Good morning, and welcome to Advanced Plaque Analysis and Next Generation FFRCT, a case-based discussion. I'm Dave Baker, and I'm on the Elucid team. I'd like to start today by introducing our two speakers. Dr. Sarah Reinhardt joins us today from her native home state of West Virginia. After completing her internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship in her home state, she conti continued her professional training at Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, where she completed a cardiac imaging fellowship in cardiovascular CT and MRI. She subsequently served as clinical assistant professor and director of cardiovascular CT MRI training at Piedmont Hospital for over 10 years and co-founded the Women's Heart Program at Piedmont Heart Institute. In the spring of 2020, Dr. Reinhardt moved back to West Virginia to join Charleston Area Medical Center. Since 2020, she served as the Associate Program Director for the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship and was appointed Program Director in June 2021 and also runs the Prevention Clinic at CAMC. She has contributed to over 30 publications, three book chapters, 40 research studies, and dozens of conference presentations. She is board certified in cardiovascular disease, DTA, and nuclear. Thank you for presenting today. And Dr. Todd Valines is currently the chief medical officer at Elucid. Dr. Valines is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular diseases, DTA, and advanced adult echocardiography. He is a former president of the SCCT and was recently editor in chief of the Journal of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography. Dr. Valines has published over 275 peer-reviewed manuscripts, three books, and eight book chapters focusing on our cardiovascular imaging outcomes and prevention. Prior to his appointment at Elucid, Dr. Valines was medical director at University of Virginia, serving as a distinguished professor of medicine, clinical cardiologist, and researcher focused on cardiovascular imaging and prevention, where he is still a professor of medicine today. Prior to his leadership at UVA, Dr. Valines served over 20 years in the United States Armed Services, having achieved the rank of Colonel in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. Thank you for your service, and thank you for opening up this webinar for us today. Well, thank you so much, Dave, and uh, I'm super excited to, to be here with Sarah, who's been a longtime friend and a leader in the field of advanced cardiovascular imaging, to talk about what I, you know, I think is a super exciting topic, and that is using advanced plaque software and using next generation FFRCT to better care for patients. Um, and so why don't we jump right into it? Um, I'm just going to start by saying, you know, we look forward to questions. And so if you have questions, we strongly encourage them. What's really exciting about this presentation to me is that we're going to go through some data, but we're also going to talk about how to practically use advanced plaque quantification, plaque characterization, and FFRCT to care for patients in a case based approach. And so I show this, you know, I've given talks over the years and I show this. And, you know, this, for many of you who are in the field, and I looked, you know, many of the participants here were some of the, you know, early users, in fact, leaders in the field of cardiac CT that are on the, are on the webinar today. And many of you remember the cover of Time Magazine from September 5th, 2005, and it said, how to stop a heart attack before it happens. And this was, of course, the promise of coronary CT angiography. And when this was published, of course, there was virtually no data to show that in fact, we could actually achieve this goal. And think about how far this field has come today. And I'm gonna highlight where we've come with regards to guidelines, where CTA is now a foundational, a first line test for symptomatic patients, how we've learned to appreciate the power of not just stenosis, but moving beyond stenosis to incorporate plaque its quantification, its characterization to refine how we educate patients, how we motivate patients, and ultimately how we treat those patients in an era where we have an armamentarium of preventive therapies that simply didn't exist five to seven years ago. And so I would argue that in fact today in 2022, that we can in fact achieve this goal, this prescient Time Magazine cover that was published now over 17 years ago. And I think, you know, this, all of you on this call, because I think you probably have, you're either doing or practicing CT, maybe you're learning to do CT, um, and you appreciate the power of having plaque in your 
treatment paradigm, having that information to better treat patients. And so we know, of course, so I think all of you are aware that heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States and industrialized countries around the world. It is very costly. And unfortunately, too many people die prematurely from this disease. We know that a large percentage of patients, roughly around half of patients, their over half of patients, their first diagnosis of having coronary heart disease is a life-altering myocardial infarction or sudden cardiac death. And I, I would argue that we all understand that CT allows us to be better, that we can simply do better than our current prevention paradigms. Now, when you look at testing strategies, we know that coronary CTA is a patient first approach. We think it is the right test for the right for, for many of our patients because current functional tests are simply they lack accuracy for predicting who is indeed at risk. It leads to under treatment. We reassure patients that you're fine. We may see some cases today where that's the case. We often send too many patients to the cath lab who simply do not have atherosclerosis and will get no benefit from that trip to the cath lab, that costly invasive uh, uh, procedure. And of course, it is not precision medicine with regards to our ability to precisely allocate prevention tools to those who need it most. Now, seeing thinking back to that Time Magazine cover and to where we are today, these were the multi-societal chest pain guidelines in 2021. Of course, now coronary CTA is given a class one recommendation as a first-line diagnostic test for both acute and chronic chest pain and was the only non-invasive test given a level of evidence a recommendation. And of course, we also understand that this can be used as a gatekeeper to the cath lab and patients with inconclusive functional tests. And for the first time, FFRCT was given a guideline-based recommendation, a class 2A recommendation in patients with an intermediate stenosis defined by the guideline writers as a stenosis between 40 and 90 percent in a proximal or middle segment of the coronary tree where revascularization may be considered. And this is quite a remarkable step because this is the first time we've seen a machine learning based software analysis at, uh, software included so prominently in cardiology guidelines. Now I wanna give, um, you know, really congratulations to the precise trial investigators because of course those guidelines were heavily criticized by many, um, not only those outside of cardiovascular medicine but many in the imaging community who said they were maybe to pro-CT, maybe FFRCT was given too much of a central role. And I would congratulate the precise trial investigators. This data presented at the AHA just a few weeks ago in Chicago, showing that in fact, a CT-based strategy that includes FFRCT is simply a patient-first, patient-centered strategy. And what, what I mean by that is, of course, the functional-based testing sends far too many patients to the cath lab who simply will get no benefit. And that the CT-based strategy remarkably reduced to those patients who had, who were referred to the car, to the cath lab who did not have disease. It's seventy percent. Think about that. Referring seventy percent of patients to the cath lab, we simply will get no benefit from that referral. I um, mean, it gets the right patients into the cath lab who will benefit most. Now we know when you think about functional testing, there's a huge advantage to understanding not just the degree of stenosis, but the amount and type of plaque that is present. And in fact, if we look within the NI, NHLBI funded PROMISE trial, this is data you're probably familiar with, and this is a, a slide shown at our last webinar by Mars Forensic, but I think it bears repeating that in fact, in, the func in patients who get functional testing, we simply do not appreciate the burden and type of atherosclerosis. And in fact, in PROMISE, the majority of events occurred in patients who had a normal functional test. And that's something as a, as a cardiovascular specialist is, is the most frustrating to have patients who have had testing, who've been reassured, who then go on to have an event within, in this trial within two years. Whereas we know that with CT, the vast majority of patients who have events have atherosclerosis. And in fact, if you look at this table, the risk is significantly increased by based on the abnormality seen on coronary CT and geography. And so it goes back to this premise that using a CT first strategy allows us to indeed not only focus on end-stage atherosclerosis, not only focus on detecting severe stenosis, but allows us to appreciate the full continuum of coronary atherosclerosis. And in fact, when using functional testing, you simply cannot treat what you do not see. Now shifting, you know, this has now come full 
you know, and this has now come full circle, the presence of plaque and how do we use this plaque to help guide therapy? We know that the SECT has published an, a very timely expert consensus document stating that in fact, the predominant predictor of risk is indeed plaque and CADRADS 2.0, if you've not taken a look at that, now has created a plaque score that states that for every coronary CTA, that sh it should be reported as an overall measure of plaque burden. And there are some options on how you do that. So the question is, of course, where does advanced quantitative plaque analysis software fit in? Well, what we know from large scale studies like Paradigm, that in fact, the largest predictors or the biggest predictors of plaque progression, and in other studies, the biggest predictor of risk are many of the things that we do not routinely measure, things such as percent atheroma, total plaque volume. These volumetric measures of plaque seem to be the strongest predictors. And this is where the potential for advanced plaque analysis and plaque quantification lies, is much of the things we're not measuring are actually most predictive of events and most predictive of patients who are most likely to progress. And perhaps these measures could better guide intensity of therapy. Now, how is Elucid unique in this field? And we know that there are a number of different software available. We know that the majority of the software, in fact, all of the software other than Elucid, simply quantify and characterize plaque according to Hounsfield units. They draw lines in the sand that say, if you're below this, you're low attenuation. If you're calcified, you're calcified, and there's everything in between. And while this is very pragmatic and efficient, um, it does not replicate biology. We know that things such as lipid-rich necrotic core, matrix, non-calcified fibrotic plaque, those plaque features have a variety of Hounsfield units. They have a heterogeneous appearance on CT. And while using Hounsfield units, again, is, is efficient, it doesn't have a biological ground truth. We also know that if you do scan, rescan on patients, or you look across populations, that in fact, how we acquire the image with regards to KVP, as well as the influence of intracoronary contrast density, that those significantly influence your, your, your uh, Hounsfield unit measures within the wall of the artery. And this has been shown time and time and again, that in fact, using Hounsfield units, while not accounting for KVP and accounting for intracoronary contrast, it, that, that those values are simply, they may not lack, they may lack repeatability and precision. And so how does Elucid assess and report plaque? Well, it starts by trying to, to use a histologic ground truth, a true quantitative imaging bio, biomarker. And so the way that the studies were performed is that they obtained fresh plaque samples. Uh, this was initially done in patients who had carotid endarterectomies. They used expert pathologist Ranu Vermani and her team to act, do cross-sections of these and to carefully pair those with cross-sectional CT angiography images. The pathologist labeled each of those cross-sections as to the tissue types as well as the volume of tissue. And these were paired with CT angiography used to train a machine learning algorithm and then tested. And how did it perform across thousands of cross sections? And this is from the label of Elucid. It performed very well with regards to both quantification and characterization of the different plaques according to what's seen under a microscope. And so there's very high accuracy, low bias, strong correlations, and low reader variability. Now, this was just published data. You can see this is now on press online in atherosclerosis, that if you can accurately quantify his, the, the tissues using histology, you can actually label each of these cross sections with regards to their risk for rupture using the Vermani Starry system. And in fact, translate this visually to overall burden of, of plaque risk across a uh, arterial tree. And this was done with high accuracy. Now, the question is, how does this translate to the coronaries? This is data from... Christos Barantis' group in BART showing that, in fact, if you compare the elucid analysis to intravascular ultrasound nears catheter in 100 vessels, you see that measures of total atheroma volume and percent atheroma volume perform very well. And having used this software on thousands of coronary uh, analysis to date, I can tell you that it, that it performs exceptionally well for accurately identifying plaque and has been used in, in uh, clinical treatment trials such as this from the NIH and patients who uh, have psoriasis who have been treated with a, a biologic therapy, that in fact, it, the in lucid analysis has been used to track regression and progression of atherosclerosis in clinical trials, uh, as well as uh, here data presented at ESC showing the performance of the elucid analysis within the evaporate trial, where in fact we see regression of lipid-rich necrotic core in patients treated with icosapent ethyl.
Now, how does all of this translate to a very unique way of estimating invasive FFR? Well, we know from early work, this is the credence trial showing that in fact, if you use models based on atherosclerotic burden and measures of atherosclerosis, then in fact, you can predict invasive FFR as, accurate, as accurately as a computational fluid dynamic approach, this so-called plaque-based FFR. And so I'm, I'll share with you the results of a multi-center study. This is currently in late stage review and has been submitted to the FDA on how this was validated. And first, like any machine learning analysis, this was trained. This was trained in 407 vessels with invasive FFR from three separate sites. These are sites separate from the validation data set. And importantly, much of the FFR training was in fact full vessel pullback so that within each vessel, you could train models using literally hundreds to thousands of data points across that vessel. And then based on this training data set, this was put to the test in a five-site validation study, 302 patients, 337 vessels, and you can see sensitivity, specificity, of, and accuracy between 0.85 and 0.87 in a population where 50% of the vessels approximately had an abnormal invasive FFR. It's easy to be accurate to normal. This software was put to the test in a very heavily diseased population, plaque-based FFR using the lucid analysis. And this just shows you how that output might look. This is isolated. This is just only showing you the LAD. This concept, of course, the reporting data showing you this overlay of atherosclerotic burden, atherosclerotic types, plaque types, as well as physiology. And so this, in summary, the lucid analysis is a plaque-based tool. The company was founded based on its ability to characterize and quantify a plaque, but now has extended that to use this information, this histologically validated plaque, to estimate invasive FFR in an entirely novel way, and that is plaque-based FFR CT. And this combination of using physiology as well as anatomy, volumetric plaque assessments, plaque characterization, we think has many uses in clinical care. You can take patients who have had a CT, are they currently responding to their current therapy? If you see, for example, a lot of lipid rich necrotic core, perhaps that's a sign that they should have therape therapeutic intensity increased. And it serves as a volumetric benchmark if these patients get scanned again in the future. And of course, plaque may inform you on who needs to go to the cath lab in patients with this so-called gray zone FFR uh, between 0.7 and 0.8. Now the lucid analysis um, is, uh, you know, would operate similar to uh, current products where the DICOM data is sent to a lucid and can be analyzed and sent back in a DICOM wrap PDF, um, as well as a physician interactive uh, interface website. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn this uh, turn this over to Sarah Reinhardt, who is my co-host and, and, uh, and presenter. And uh, she's going to take us through how she has used software in her career, both FFRCT and plaque analysis software, has started these programs and now uses this on the front lines of patient management in her practice. Thank you, Todd, uh, for the invitation to speak. It is super exciting uh, to speak on the next uh, developmental stage of FFRCT and plaque analysis. My disclosures are as follows. So one of the questions that Todd asked me is, why did I invest in a program for evaluation of CTFFR as well as plaque? So when I started reading CT, we, we knew that plaque developed into a luminal stenosis. And at some point that anatomic problem became a functional problem where the patients developed angina. But throughout the last 15 to 20 years, there's been significant progress in understanding. When we first started reading, it was all about stenosis and we were sending the moderate stenoses for nuclear, the severe stenoses to the cath lab. But what we saw is we were doing a lot of downstream testing and we had uh, a high false positive rate, which was the limitation of CT. But again, when FAME2 came out, we realized that it's even broader than that moderate stenosis. It's in that 40 to 90% range. And for the field to really grow and to really do the patients the best service possible, we really wanted a yes, no answer on who needed just medical therapy or who really needed to go to the cath lab in an effective way. And with all of these trials recently, we have seen with the evolution of FFRCT um, that we've really been able to transform the care of our patients, which is so exciting. 
So from a pathophysiologic point of view, we know that we have to have knowledge of both anatomy as well as physiology. And coronary flow is actually determined by a large category of things. And at first we focused just on stenosis or luminal dimensions. And then we were looking at more plaque composition type, which ones were high risk plaque, um, such as what uh, Dr. Motoyama's uh, data showed several years ago. And now we're really transforming into adding the next element of that, which is the plaque burden or the percent atheroma volume. The super exciting thing for me is, you know, when I first started doing research, we were looking at CT versus IVIS with virtual histology and FFR, but we also looked at biomarkers. So very early on in my career, I was able to correlate the genotype, which is the lipids, with the phenotype, which is the CTA findings of atherosclerosis. So I learned very early on to guide my treatment decisions based off of the CTA findings. And for me, the uh, evolution in the new chest pain guidelines to a class 1A indication for CT is all because we can diagnose CAD, but it truly guides our treatment decisions uh, downstream. So when starting uh, two different programs and developing two different programs, the first in Atlanta, we look at the very different patient populations that we're serving. So the Southeast has a high burden of disease, but if you look at the Atlanta metropolitan area, it's 5 million people, but the outcomes are much better. And a lot of that is led because of access of care. And although CV death is the number one cause of death, we see that mortality rate is decreasing in Georgia and the age adjusted death rate is about 77 per 100,000 patients. But in West Virginia, we have a huge heart issue. We are ranked number one in the nation with prevalence of heart attack and coronary artery disease and seventh highest in prevalence of stroke. The interesting thing is it's primarily among men who are elderly and those with less than a high school education, as well as very low income families have a very high prevalence of cardiovascular disease. So when we look at West Virginia, we know that the Northern Panhandle and the Eastern Panhandle are actually have better access to care to more high-end centers such as in Washington, DC, UVA, Pittsburgh, as well as Richmond. Um, but when you look at our healthcare centers within our state, the real problem is the Southern part of the state because it's extremely rural. So even though this looks close proximity, it is actually very difficult to traverse to these healthcare centers. But it's also where the coal mining community communities are, where there is dying out in very low income families and access to care. So our CV death rate in a state that has 2 million people compared to the 5 million in Atlanta has a two to three fold higher death rate of 177 to 231 deaths per 100,000. So again, when we look at this and how we compare how I developed the Atlanta market with HeartFlow, again, we started our program very early with CT. And again, the Atlanta market has better access to care, whether it is um, the wealthy or, or the um, uh, African-American or the poor, because you have Grady, you have Emory, you have Wellstar, and you have Piedmont. But a large portion of the patients we had at Piedmont were well-educated. They were more prevention-oriented. And before insurance covered coronary CT, they were willing to pay out of pocket. So we made a very affordable price for that. And we had years of development of this uh, CT program. And we started to develop, to develop a hub-and-spoke model over the last few years before I left, where we had sites at Blairsville, uh, which had a higher burden of disease. When we opened up the fractional flow reserve assessment, we definitely saw the most impact in decreasing downstream nuclear testing. But again, a lot of our things were more prevention. So the crossover um, to fractional flow reserve may have been a little less until we started scanning more complex patients. When we look at West Virginia statistics, again, we have a very elderly patient population who are disabled with a very low median household income of 44,000 and 20% in poverty. And what we see in our community, it's not uh, about the so, um, just the education or the economy, but it's all linked to access to healthcare that 
uh, improves or excuse, excuse me, it actually increases the healthcare disparities in our patient population. Because healthcare access is an issue because 20% of our patients don't have a healthcare provider, 15% can't afford it, and 20% don't have routine follow-up. So to me, a CT first pathway is critical because you may only have one opportunity to see these patients. So understanding the plaque burden to start medical therapy, but also get them into the cath lab or not into the cath lab if appropriate, in one touch point is critical, but also in this patient op population where education may be limited, seeing is believing, and they may actually be more compliant with care if they truly can see it and understand the process of what we're dealing with. These are high risk plaques. This is why you need to start therapy. So what is the bridge to success of building a successful program? Again, know your market, again, what is the disease burden and what are the reimbursement issues and what are the challenges for those patients to receive care? You have to get both general cardiologist as well as your interventionalist on board with the program. And I can't underscore partnering with a prevention program because we have the opportunity to see disease across the spectrum, they all need preventive strategies. Again, once you understand the market, you can actually invest in a good cardiac scanner because our most obese and high-risk patients are the more complex to scan because they're going to have elevated heart rates and elevated BMIs. And it, it critical to that success in scanning a broader number of patients is that development of an FFR program. Investing in your technologist and entire imaging team is critical because it, it's an entire team process. And when you personally train them, they know you are vested in the success of the program and the care of the patients. And it's important to educate not only the cardiologist on appropriate use criteria, but also the primary care providers on appropriate use, but also how to make sense out of the clinical reports, because they may be the driving force behind these prevention uh, strategies to modify therapy downstream. And again, I offer volunteer scans to administrators because once they see the process, they see their pictures, and then they hear the pitch, they're more likely to build uh, buy-in to the program. So when I first came to West Virginia, it was a rule-out disease program where we had less than 100 scans per month. But when we transform that to a CT first pathway, by the way, right when COVID started, it actually has progressed significantly and we're now doing over 600 scans a month. So CT first or a rule in disease program is very possible regardless of where you may be in the United States or elsewhere. So a little background prior to doing the cases, it's important to note that there's geometrical changes, so it's such as positive remodeling uh, with preservation of luminal size, but then subsequent luminal stenosis. But these changes may be more difficult to track over time. But if you look at the lipid rich necrotic core on composition or plaque composition, transforming to more fibrous and subsequently calcified plaque with the um, advanced imaging, as well as the artificial intelligence from products such as Elucid, these are easier to track over time with the right type of software as well as images from our CTs. But it is super important to understand what that percent atheroma volume is. So what you do is you take that total vessel volume, which includes the wall and the lumen, and you actually subtract out that lumen volume, and that is your atheroma volume. And then you divide that by the total vessel volume to get your percent atheroma volume. And this is a measure along with plaque composition that really tells us if disease is progressing or regressing over time. So our first case is a 51 year old pa patient who had a few intermittent episodes of chest pain, but he's able to do significant exertional activity without much limitation. But he has multiple risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and family history. He is on Crestor 10, but his LDL is still 172, which suggests he probably had a familial underlying hyperlipidemia and probably should have been started on a high-intensity statin from the origin of looking at his labs. 
But if you're looking at the labs he presents with today, his risk estimator is 5.5%. Now you can take that forward and say, okay, I've got risk enhancing features such as family history, uh, that LDL is persistently over 160. You can look at other biomarkers as well, such as the CRP. But again, how to know when to titrate those therapies can be uh, quite complex as we go forward. If the patient were asymptomatic and we're looking at a calcium score to titrate therapy, what the guidelines recommend is a calcium score over 100 or 75th percentile, you definitely want to initiate statin, but his didn't even fit into that category. So again, looking at the MESA risk calculator, you may want to titrate therapy. But again, how many people or PCPs may know all about these different risk estimators? But if you look at the plaque, it makes the decision so much simpler because again, seeing the disease burden can really transform your understanding of what you need to do. So if you look at this particular patient, he's got a very bulky non-calcified plaque in the LED. It's got some low attenuation plaque and positive remodeling. And you can see just by analyzing it with our software, it was between 50 and 80% stenosed. Using a lucid software, again, you can see that um, the RCA circ and left main had no lesion specific ischemia. And while the LAD did not have meet that threshold for lesion specific ischemia, there was a significant delta or drop between pro the FFR proximal to the lesion and distal to the lesion. So this can suggest a potential problem in this patient. So again, when you're looking at that LAD, number one, we can look at what the percent stenosis is. Was there lesion specific uh, hemodynamic significant of that lesion? But we can see here on that plaque volume, for instance, that it's very complex non-calcified plaque with evidence of a lipid rich necrotic core. And it actually takes 50% of that vessel by volume. So again, as we're looking at this, um, we can see that there is some complex plaque. So again, as we're going forward post-CTA, we discussed with the patient, he was started on aspirin, beta blocker, Emdur, Crestor was intensified. However, within two to three weeks of the CT, he, he was back at the ER with multiple episodes of chest pain and underwent cath and PCI for an 80 to 90% stenosis. So with that, it raised a suspicion with that bulky plaque that transformed our intensification of therapy. But we could tell the patients ahead of time, you may have issues because of the complexity of plaque in this patient. So case two is on the other extreme. It's a 63 year old male with extremely complex PAD and a, a abdominal aortic aneurysm who was referred for preoperative testing. He does have shortness of breath with exertion, but it's difficult because he smokes and he is a coal miner. So, but he has multiple risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and smoking. He's on a fairly good regimen, but he's only on a moderate intensity of statin, and that needs to be changed because there is that drug-drug interaction between the Norvask and the Zocor. But again, EF was preserved. But if you look at his LDL, it was 21. He has some residual risk because his HDL is extremely low, triglycerides are elevated, but A1C is 7.5 but he has severe PAD. So again, his statin was intensified regardless of the LDL. Um, he was changed to Topral, but a stress test was ordered because of preoperative stress testing needs and his dyspnea on exertion. What we know from PAD patients is that they have between 50 and 80% prevalence of coronary artery disease. And we're when we are risk stratifying them for surgery, they have a much higher risk of major adverse cardiac events. But if we revascularize those patients, even six months prior uh, to their surgical intervention, their risk is actually higher. But we also know that troponin leaks confer a 26 to 55% decrease in survival through the next five years. So high disease burden, complex decision. But again, in a patient with no known coronary artery disease in this high-risk patient population, ischemia testing may fail to diagnose CAD because one in seven widow makers may be normal and 50% could be normal or mildly abnormal. So with this patient, 
He had a successful uh, EVAR placed with renal artery stents, but literally post-operatively had an ischemic leg. He had progressive shortness of breath and developed pneumonia. He had a type 2 MI initially, likely from widely fluctuating blood pressures and low hemoglobin. And as his course progressed, he ended up with a non-STEMI of with a high sensitive sensitivity troponin of 5,800. So once he was a little bit more stable, he underwent CT. So you can see the burden of disease present. He has a chronically occluded right coronary, but he has very complex sequential lesions in the LED. Here's a non-calcified plaque. Here's a severe dense calcium. The ramus in the circ had non-obstructive disease. But even with the left main, you had this osteostenosis that you can see here with a circumferential or horseshoe-shaped calcification, which may warrant further evaluation. So again, with a lucid, the FFR of the left main was not significant, but the LED was significant, and you had these two areas that we were looking at. So again, even though the stenosis may not have been significant, there was lesion-specific ischemia by a fractional flow reserve, but you can look at this high burden of disease throughout that LAD, and again, there was a component of both lipid-rich necrotic core as well as that non-calcified matrix. And again, when we look at uh, a Lucid's picture, you can see there's very different plaque patterns throughout the course of that vessel. So remember, this patient's LDL was 21 on a moderate intensity statin. So what I tell people is this disease burden is out of proportion to the cholesterol. So assessment of plaque burden can literally tell us when we need to titrate therapy because this does not make clinical sense. So we have to look for where the residual risk for this patient is so we can adjust therapies downstream. The next case is a 70-year-old female. And again, with the new chest pain guidelines, I like it because I use anginal equivalent a lot when I'm justifying use for CT because she was a female presenting with shortness of breath of exertion uh, and symptoms of fatigue. Again, multiple risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. She was not on any anti-anginal therapy and on a moderate intensity statin. But again, her LDL was not excessively high. Her HDL was decreased, which could be some risk, and her diabetes was not optimally controlled. Her EKG had nonspecific changes and an incomplete right bundle branch block. And again, she had a stress test, and this started in the first week of August, and they felt like it was attenuation but could not rule out ischemia, maybe abnormal. Again, no TID, EF was normal. Um, plan two to three weeks later was maybe for a left heart cath, but it was not approved by insurance. So then she started developing chest pressure and tightness and progressively worsening shortness of breath. So they decided to do an echo to rule out valvular disease. So finally, with escalation of symptoms, by the end of September, she has a CTA. And what you see here is multi-vessel severe disease. You have severe uh, diffuse calcification with severe stenosis in the right. But what you see is this high-grade prox LED lesion, severe disease in the diagonal, high-grade complex plaque in the proximal left circumflex, and disease in the OM. And this is by the end of September. What heart elucids um, fractional flow reserve showed was a significant lesion-specific ischemia in all three epicardial vessels, which is very prominent. And again, when you look at this cross-sectional image of that LED stenosis, you see that lipid-rich necrotic core or low attenuation plaque. And again, in that circumflex, you can see the napkin ring sign and low attenuation plaque as well. So when you look at Elucid's plaque analysis, this tells the whole story in one picture, which is what I love, in that you see it's three vessel significant stenosis, three vessel lesion specific FFR, but look at the plaque burden across the entire epicardial tree with 70% per percent atheroma volume. And in that LAD, it had, again, that lipid rich necrotic core that was so prevalent when we saw it.
And it's important to understand these high risk plaque features because we know from Motoyama's work that low attenuation plaques, positive remodeling and spotty calcification have been associated with development of acute coronary syndrome. And the more features positive that you have, the more likely you are to develop ACS. The napkin ring sign is also a high risk feature. And the more low attenuation plaque that you have, you can have at least a five-fold increase in risk of fatal and non-fatal MIs. But again, the exciting thing for me with Lucid software is now it's not just the low attenuation plaque that we're looking at. We can actually potentially look at the true lipid rich necrotic core, which can help us further enhance our knowledge and adjustment of therapies downstream. Because again, in this patient, her LDL was 60. She had three vessel disease. She wasn't on anti-anginal therapy. So her disease burden is out of proportion. Look at her plaque burden. Where is her residual risk? It's so critical. So because of her high-risk plaque, we literally called her that night, as well as the physician, to expedite transfer. And she was started on therapy. Her heart enzymes were normal. But again, her heart cast showed thrombotic burden present, as well as hazy stenosis, and she underwent emergent cabbage. So just the identification of that plaque expedited her care. It took two months using a stress test-based strategy for her to get to an outcome that had she had CT first, we could have accomplished within less than one week, potentially. So this is a case where I look at where would I pl track plaque over time? So this is a 40-year-old female who works at one of our hospitals, and she is actually friends with one of our new imaging technologists. And she's had an LDL in the 160s for years, but is non-compliant with her medications. So they convinced her to have a calcium score. She's 40 years old. Her calcium score is 421, and it's at the 99th percent, uh, percentile by MESA. So by the appropriate use criteria, we can do a nuclear because there's a higher incidence of obstructive disease present in those with calcium scores over 400. But if she were truly asymptomatic, we may not have a justification to go for a coronary CT, but what better way to plaque, track her plaque over time? So she presented to me in the prevention clinic, she was having some symptoms of uh, sharp chest pain, possibly cardiac, what I would have determined is very atypical prior to the new guidelines. But we diagnosed her with familial hyperlipidemia. We looked for residual risks. She has an elevated LP little a, but she also has unique risk factors for female, including a miscarriage and preeclampsia, as well as family history. So by the time she saw me, her LDL was 256 with an elevated LP little a of 147 and a positive Dutch lipid score, which is consistent with probable familial hyperlipidemia. So her CTA shows diffuse disease, possibly a severe stenosis here, potentially moderate stenosis in the diagonal. But what we did is we escalated her therapy very quickly. Um, her LDL went from 256 down to 56, over the course of approximately six to eight months using Crestor as well as Repatha. But the question is her LDL is now at goal. Will this disease progress or regress or will it stay stable? She still has an elevated LP little a. If the disease progresses, is she now a candidate for those potential novel therapies that are going to be available soon? And what about her children? I advised her to have her children tested. Her 14-year-old daughter has an LDL of 152 as well as an elevated LP little a. Her 12-year-old son has an LDL of 189. And her third child has a normal LDL but has an elevated LP little a. So they're currently seeing a lipidologist uh, in Ohio. So with increasing awareness of heterozygous FH, which still has a lot of growth, uh, to happen, to identify it earlier, these patients can be started on lipid lowering therapy earlier. When should we image and how do we check, track their disease in response to therapy to know when we need to titrate? I think again, the new definition, and I, I adapted this from a slide uh, presented at last Elucid seminar, we can use CT to define the ad the advantage of using PACSK9. So I'm able to get PCSK9 inhibitors approved with CT. I no longer have to go to heart catheterization. But what we want to 
predict or note is, is there a progression of disease? And a progression of disease at any stage is an increase in that percent atheroma volume, regardless of the change in the geometry. And regression of disease is actually a decrease in that atheroma volume, whether or not the lumen changes. So how can assessment of plaque help? Again, identification of high-risk plaque features may prompt earlier intervention or how we counsel our patients or um, adjust their therapy. I think there's a gap in the guidelines when the LDL is truly less than 70. We know how to titrate therapy when the LDL is above 70, but what about that discordant patient where the disease is out of proportion to the LDL number? We should be concerned when the lipid-rich necrotic core is increasing or if PAV is increasing despite therapy. And again, it is much more easily discernible to track changes in that composition over time than the geometry. Because what we want to see is the stabilization of those plaque composition over time with potential decrease in that atheroma volume. So again, we know it's more than just the atherogenic milieu. It could be ge geometry of the coronary arteries, flow, or shear stress. But if you note that there is progression of disease, we have to look for what that residual risk is. We can't just focus on atherogenesis from the lipoproteins. We also have to dive deep into the metabolism of our patients, inflammatory diseases, environmental uh, concerns, endothelial dysfunction, as well as thrombosis. So hopefully with use of CTA, advanced imaging analysis, artificial intelligence, and prevention assessment, we can transform the care of our patients and improve downstream mortality. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you very much to both of you for uh, great presentations. So we wanna move to the questions that have been asked here. Um, and uh, let me start here, uh, Dr. Reinhardt, with you. Um, what are some of your lessons learned from bringing in this new technology? I think it is how to teach other people. You know, when you have numbers that you can actually track over time, you can say, we're doing what we need to do or we have more work to do. So some people don't understand, well, my primary care physician says that my LDL looks fine. So I think it helps us to explain how we're improving things over time. And I think it's difficult for people to understand that discordance where your disease is out of proportion to the numbers. But once you can show a picture as well as show them how much plaque they have, it, it improves compliance with therapy. Um, so I just saw a patient who was very resistant P to PCSK9s. He's had all graphs down. <laughs> His LDL is 80. I'm like, this is the one thing I can do to improve your outcomes. And when I explained it to him and he saw and understood, he was willing to try the therapy. So I think it actually improves our explanation to patients and improve compliance downstream. Okay, very good. Um, Dr. Valines, to you, I wanna combine two questions in the chat. I think I can do this uh, into one. One is asking about the rejection rate um, of, our, uh, of our scans. And second, discussing the workflow a little bit. So CT turnaround time, what's actually in the report, and who's verifying this uh, in the in the elucid analysis? Yeah, those are great questions. And I just want to just start by you know just you know congratulating Sarah. I mean, she she highlighted so many points. Before I answer your question, just about the challenges that we see with functional testing, these discrepancies that we continually see, and how we can actually measure actual disease to tell patients, you know. Are you on the right therapy? Do you need to escalate therapy? Educate them, show them the images. And in my, in my clinic, my PAC system is up almost continually showing people those images. And we'll, I think we'll get to a question about that. So they're really good questions. The first question is about rejection rate. And that's something that, you know, people who have used, um, you know, FFRCT, um, you know, that's always been a, a concern. Um, we, you know, if you look at the multi-site study that I have presented, it hopefully will be in, in press soon. Um, the reasons for rejection based on imaging, um, the overall rate of rejection was 
that was mainly due to poor contrast delivery in the coronaries. And so obviously there's a, there's a, a minimum, uh, you know, a degree of contrast that's required to ensure uh, overall good image quality. And so what's unique about this technology, maybe perhaps which is unique compared to, to, to technologies others might be used to, is that it is a plaque-based FFR. And so the analysis is not so critically dependent on exact precise lumen segmentation, um, meaning that if there's an artifact in the circumflex, we can still provide FFR on the LAD, for example. And so we do have some flexibility there. We anticipate that that rejection rate uh, in a clinical trial setting will actually go down um, as, um, you know, over time uh, to, to be significantly lower than that. In fact, we anticipated it to be well under 5% um, because the one, the cases that we rejected were just gross, co poor contrast delivery. Within that trial, we did not pre-select cases based on image quality. So we said, let's take all CT scans and patients who were done within 60 days of going to the cath lab. And so these were just overtly bad CT scans, quite frankly, that could be easily corrected just by good clinical practice using CT. These were not, um, you know, minor, minor artifacts. These would be scans that I think all of you clinically would have a hard time reading them clinically. And so that rejection rate, I think, will be markedly lower. This was an all-comers five-site study where, where we didn't use a pre-specified unique imaging protocol or pre-select patients uh, based on image quality. And so uh, every scan that wasn't just grossly abnormal and had to be rejected, well, all of those were processed and had no problems at all. And so there was never a case where we said, I think we can process this and we couldn't. Okay, and that's an important thing. We, you know, we didn't try to analyze cases and then come to find out that the software failed. These were overtly bad CT scans. So that I think this, you know, the, I think the rejection rate clinically will continue to evolve. We anticipate it will be, you know, very very single digits um, based uh, on the nuance that I just just described. Um, and I think the second part of that question was workflow. And so um, a typical elucid conducted analysis will be one that you know you, you do a you do a coronary CTA at your institution. And the patient meets uh, use case criteria for you doing FFRCT. Current guidelines would say a stenosis between 40 to 90 percent and a proximal to mid vessel. Um, that DICOM data set would be sent to Elucid. You can send multiple phases. Um, we will do, um, you know, that comes into our uh, analyst workflow. We uh, at that point, we'll assign it to an analyst and uh, segment the arteries, assuming that there's no gross image quality issues, meaning that assuming you sent us the right phase, you sent us the contrast CT, that it's reconstructed in an appropriate field of view, et cetera. Um, and so once that analysis has started, we do have a person who verifies the, the, the quality of the analysis at every step. And so after the initial uh, segmentation is, uh, is performed by the software, we have a, an analyst who confirms that that indeed that was done in, in, in an accurate way and it almost always is, but we do have someone checking that quality. At that point, there's um, the tissue um, uh, characterization and quantification and FFRCT analysis. And then again, there's a quality check. Um, and once that is confirmed, our trained analyst, we have a QC person who confirms that and that result will then be verified and sent back to the site. Um, and then in my day-to-day -day job is overseeing that process. And so that's something we take a lot of pride in, in doing that, uh, doing that accurately. So once, once we have FDA approval, which we anticipate uh, imminently, then that will be the workflow. Um, and that comes back to the is the DICOM rep PDF that can be um, uh, incorporated into PACs and incorporated to the EHR. I'll try to combine two both. questions here for you. One is a question about the recommendation for the frequency to monitor progression regression after you've done the uh, study and, and for. So let me start with prevention follow up. So, one of the things we did was starting our ER studies, uh, ER program, uh, where we're trying to develop a CT first strategy is regardless of whether it's non obstructive or obstructive. If they're not attached to a cardiologist, we're actually um, sending those patients to the prevention center for follow-up. Um, so standardly, I, I check an LP little a, a lipid panel, and an ApoB on almost every patient. If it's a female patient, I'll check a CRP. I do a very detailed 
family history as well as uh, pregnancy history in our females and look for autoimmune diseases um, because I think um, all of that is very critical. I look at every CT image that's in the system before I see patients. Um, I think that's one important thing because again, whether it's of the abdomen where I can look for a disease in the aorta, I think all of those are very critical um, to transforming therapy. So I use typically use a lot of ApoB targets specifically because we have a high diabetic patient population and I think it's much more predictive. Uh, because it's more of a particle number. So I think that's a better target, especially for people with triglycerides, um, diabetes, or LP little a. So knowing the right target for your patient. Um, what was the second question? Uh, specific to the progression regression. Okay, so so it depends on the patient population and what I'm trying to do. Um, so I just had a PAD patient um, who I did an, an initial CT scan who had non-obstructive disease, but it was very non-calcified plaque throughout their uh, burden. I did hers at a year um, simply because it was moderate disease burden. I can tell you during the process, um, she was a smoker, she quit smoking. Her diabetes, her A1C was like nine, it's now controlled. And we have her LDL now controlled after a year. But I, I did it at a year, not just because that's what I wanted to track uh, the disease progression, but she actually was having some symptoms. So I, I use symptoms to really guide me, but I do think that algorithm we, we can hopefully standardize as an imaging team. And I think looking at the degree of stenosis and saying, okay, if it's a se severe lesion with no lesion-specific ischemia, we may want to do that within a year. If it's a moderate stenosis, maybe within two to three years. So I think looking at the burden of disease as well as stenosis will help you determine that follow-up, but symptoms should always trigger that um, more frequently if needed. Okay, great. We may, we may be down to our last question. We'll see. I'd like to, I think you, you both may want to answer this one. This is around calcium scoring. And once that's done, is further testing really necessary? How do you justify uh, the costs of plaque and FFRCT costs um, over that calcium scoring data alone that you receive? Yeah, maybe I'll start. I mean, I think calcium scoring is a very um, well-studied test. I've certainly been involved in many of those studies with regards to asymptomatic patients. I, th I think we know that it has significant limitations when used in symptomatic patients. You just saw an example by Sarah where a patient had a calcium score of three and had a percent atheroma of 50% in their LED. And that it actually speaks to the potential, I say potential, for using CT angiography in a screening population. We, just, we know that CT is certainly a better test with regards to detecting all types of plaque, assessing plaque risk, quantifying plaque burden and predicting, um, you know, overall patient risk. If you look at performance in, in, in both symptom, in mainly, mainly driven from symptomatic patients. And recently, two large scale studies, the SCAPIS and Miami Heart Studies showing that, um, you know, that you do detect slightly more disease even in asymptomatic patients. And so I, I think if you're going to use CT technologies, particularly in a symptomatic patient, you would do CT and geography. And I think that's in an era where we're using such low contrast, such low radiation doses, the acquisition is so much more automated that, you know, using, using contrast and doing CT and geography is not the challenge that it was, you know, back in 2005, 2006. I don't know, Sarah, your thoughts. I think the same is true because, you know, I still use calcium scoring, um, especially if they're asymptomatic. Um, I think it has its utility. I, I call it the mammogram or colonoscopy of the heart. Um, and, and we're launching that program as well. But I will tell you with the new change in the chest pain guidelines, if you're truly looking at a high-risk patient population like I have, the majority of my patients have shortness of breath with exertion. And it's just asking them how much they can do. And the majority of them are actually symptomatic by the time they come to see me. So I, I do think starting and launching that in the primary care setting earlier, but getting them to the prevention strategies. But again, using those anginal equivalents to really expand who we're using in symptomatic patients, I think is part of the key going forward.
Very good. Well, we do want to thank everybody for your time today. We're at time. And for the remainder of the questions in the chat, uh, I know Dr. Blinds and Dr. Reinhardt can take a peek and perhaps respond. Uh, yeah, we'll try to, we'll try to respond thank you very in the much chat so we can we keep the chat open. I want to make sure we respond to all the questions. Very good. And we want to thank the FCCT for sponsoring this today and we wish everybody a great day and a happy holiday season. Thank you.